<laughs> Thank you. Thank you for coming. Are you excited? Yeah. Oh, man, I am so excited. Oh, man. You, you know, it can, it'll even get better if you all just draw off of what's inside of me because, you know, I was sent back for you. I, I don't want to be here. <laughs> you know, I just really don't want to be here. <laughs> no, don't take that wrong, but I'm telling you, where I was, no one wants to come back. No one. You can, ask, you can ask the surgeon. I woke up from the operating table crying because I had to come back. <laughs> I actually was crying. I didn't want to come back, but he t Jesus told me. He said, it's not about you. It's about the people that you're send, being sent to. They need to hear what you've seen and what you've heard. Okay? So draw off of the Holy Spirit's gift in people. Pray in the spirit silently to yourself while, while I'm talking, and I will answer your questions. M my wife didn't say this, but in all the meetings that we go to, the people come up and they say, you answered my question, and it was random because you were talking about something else, and all of a sudden you just turned and you said, that's the kind of thing, you know, rather than call you out, you know, so that you can say you were called out by me, you know, that would take, uh, you know, all afternoon and this evening to, to minister to each one of you individually, now, I've done that in churches, but it was because the Lord told me to. But I can do it from here. You can get your answer. Because I'm just listening to God. I'm not doing this on my own. Trust me, I don't need to do this. I don't need to do this. And I'm the kind of person who likes to be in the orchestra pit and never be known. And I, in fact, you wouldn't believe what had to happen just to write my first book. Jesus had to appear to me and say, you know, that book's a mandate. He made me write it. I went 23 years without even telling my pastor what happened to me. I wasn't allowed to talk about it for 23 years. So if I wanted to make money or be a big shot, I would have done it right away, you know, 25 years ago. But I did not because it's sacred. So for me to do this and to act like I'm not even nervous up here is, is crazy because I'm not like that. I, I'd rather like do stuff in secret and, and, and I'm just that way. And it's not, it's not about... It's not about me. It's about you. So just know that, that, that you, you will get your package today. But the reason you're going to get it is because God has designed a, a plan that, of implementation in these last days that's beyond your understanding. Be, like right now, as I'm talking, the room is filling up with him. And you'll feel like you don't have a body anymore. There, many of you will feel like you're floating and then our, our, our services last five hours, and it's, I, I actually hand the mic over at the hour, and no one can close. Our longest service is 11 hours. I, I closed every hour for 11 hours. And one, per, one couple crawled to their car. They could not, no one could leave, no one could get up. No one, no one dared move. In, in, um, in my, in my, our spiritual parents are Jesse and Kathy Duplantis. When I speak in their church, I get 25 minutes. But when I speak, all of a sudden, like, I look and there's a whole pew missing and they're on the floor laughing and I didn't even touch anybody. <laughs> 25 minutes. So you, you, do you understand? Don't put limitations on me calling you out or you got to get knocked out of your chair or, you know, I got to point to you and, and, and say something to you because God is in the room. He's ministering to you right now. He's already has. Okay, here, here's some things that i got to tell you before I start to teach. We're going to be teaching from uh, the book Heavenly Realms, praying from the Heavenly Realms. You have to understand the, the story behind these things because the story will minister to you just as much. The story of why God does things for people and in people's lives is for other people. Now, it's, it's one thing for, for a person to die, to, to see heaven and then be sent back. It's one thing for that. And then you say, well, you know, that's everything that happens to Kevin is because, you know, he got to have that happen. And because he's going to God's favorites and, you know, you get this thing where you, you kind of put me in a box. But see, don't do that with me because Jesus didn't refer to me as an apostle or a prophet or a pastor, teacher, evangelist. He, he referred to me as Kevin. And he said that the greatest in the kingdom is, is the servant of all. He said that if, because I chose not to put myself in the front, I got promoted. Because I chose to serve others, then, then, then I, I, I find myself in a position where people want to serve me. They want to help me now. But I, I served under a pastor 
Now listen to me. We were assistant pastors while I worked full-time and my wife had a business. She worked full-time. We served the pastor for four years and I never got to speak from this pulpit. I got a Sunday school class and I had gone to heaven. And Jesus would, would appear to me every year to check up on me. And now I'm asked to go to that church several times a year. And that pastor is waiting for me. He wants to carry my Bible. He wants to protect me from bad people. He wants to do everything for me. Well, what happened? You see, I served him. Are you getting this? Okay. Okay, so do you have to understand something? It's not, there are no superheroes in heaven except one. You know, there's only one. And, and that's it. You know, everyone else, God set in the church some to be. God sets. There's a key there. Did you notice I said God sets? God sets. So you don't wake up one morning and you're a prophet. Because every prophet I know doesn't want to be a prophet. Every apostle I know that's really an apostle, they don't want to be an apostle. They, they don't. Because what you're carrying is for the next generation. You're not only carrying this generation, you're carrying the next generation on your shoulders. Hello. Do you want responsible for the next generation? You know, that is something that only God can set. I'm speaking from your future right now. I, I went to your future, and I'm speaking to you as though it's my now, but it's your future. I'm talking to you right now from a place that you haven't even lived yet. But I've been there. I've been to your future. I've seen the end already. I've been shown things that are going to happen in the next several years. They're my now, right now. Like there's people in here being healed right now. You, you could feel it. You could feel it in your body right now. You feel your heart starting to get soft. That's, that's the power of God. That's not a superhero. So I tell you this because this is the thing. You cannot give up something for God that God asks you to give up. You cannot give it up and not get, get something back. It's not about giving so you can get. It's about giving so that you can live in the supernatural. You have to trade this life for his life. So see, some of you all, you don't even understand that. But see, once you die and you're given your life back, it's not, no longer yours. But see, that's what Jesus said it should be anyway. <laughs> so think about it. We, we come through this process of dying to self. And it takes a whole lifetime. And I'm telling you, today, it can happen. You don't have to take a lifetime. Because once you hear these stories, you're going to say, you know what? That's the shortcut to the supernatural. I just need to give it up. I need to get over myself. How many understand what I'm saying? You've got to get over yourself. Because God wants to use you, but he wants you to enjoy the journey. Now, I have a responsibility to speak to this generation because if I don't, the next generation is going to write about us, how we missed it. And I'm not going to let that happen. I was told that my publisher will be publishing books about this generation if I don't speak through that publisher now. So I have 59 titles I still have to write. And this has all just been with Jesus 45 minutes. It was a whole week, but it was compressed into 45 minutes. I got I to gotta speak to this generation because we are the generation that it can choose to wrap it up. Now, what has happened in the, in the political realm and in the governments, all through the world, everything has been put on hold. But see, nobody really discerned it. There was an opportunity for it all to end. And all the prophecy teachers be all excited. Because all their charts, you know, it just happened just like that, bam, bam, bam. Or... What Jesus did is he, he, he visited me, and he said, you know, you can, you can stop all this. And he did this five years ago. He visited me. He took me up above the United States. And he said, you know, you can delay all this. He showed me the next war with Israel, Psalms 83. All these nations around Israel were going to start a fight. It wasn't going to be Armageddon. He said, you know, you can stop this indefinitely. He used that word indefinitely. 
And I'm like, he said, you know, all, all the, the teachings you're listening to, they're right in their theology, but they're wrong in their timing. Because the church has been sent, is, is here to stop this stuff. Because he, this is what he said. He said, I cannot come back until the harvest is in. He said, Russia needs to come in. The Middle East needs to come in. And Russia, China, that was it. Thank you. I already told him that. <laughs> Thank you. China. And he doesn't even know when he's coming back, but he does know he's not coming back until they come in. Oh, did you hear me? Yeah. Because it's already been spoken that he wishes no one to perish. Yeah. Okay, so he, he said, you know you can stop this indefinitely through prayer. And then he instructed me. He said, now, when it does happen, he said, because the prophets have spoken it, he said, it will have to happen eventually. But you can keep pushing it forward, keep pushing it away indefinitely. And he said, in fact, I have a trump card in my back pocket. That's what he said five years ago. And I said, what? what? He, said, he said, yeah, he's the man. I said, I don't even like him. He said, this is what Jesus says, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. That's what he said to me. No, I didn't get on TV and say Trump's going to be president. I didn't do nothing. I didn't say nothing. But I knew a trump card in his back pocket. And he's smiling at me. He said, I can delay all of this indefinitely. And so everything has been put on hold that Satan has designed. Now, if you can't, if you can't be successful in this country, you can't be successful anywhere. Because it's all set up for you to prosper now, to fund what's about to happen. God needs the money to be taken from the world and put into his work. Now how, I, now, how this is supposed to happen is you're supposed to prosper. Okay, and you steal from the devil. You steal from his system. Now, he, I was told that if you find a penny out there in a parking lot, that the devil looks at that as you stealing from his system because you, you, could, you could take that and do something for God with it. So he looks at your paycheck. That he told me, he said, your paycheck... When you get a paycheck from a, 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 a company, he, the, if it's, you're a Christian, the Satan looks at that as you're stealing from his system because you're going to put that to work for things that God's doing in your life. And you're going to take a portion of it and set the whole thing apart. So see, tithing is, is God is what he's doing is he say, if you give 10, I sanctify the whole the 90 and then the devil can't touch it see it's all about ownership and dominion but you you're, you're just arguing if god wants you to prosper or not that has nothing to do because there's no money in heaven it's like it's like it's like jesus told me he said the father loves it when you say thank you but see he he can still live without the thank you but he likes it because he's a person that has feelings well, he has feelings, too, when you work, you sell yourself to your job or your company, and they don't pay you enough. You're, they don't pay you what you're worth. You're worth much more than what your company pays you. So God has to make it up. <laughs> but you don't get it. So you don't want to hold on to 10%. But what you're doing is you're giving God the permission to make up what you're, and make it worth what you're really worth. But see, we don't judge ourselves by money. That's not what I'm talking about here. How about the fact that I don't get sick? How about the fact that I'm still driving the same vehicle that I bought brand new in 2000, and they can't figure out why it won't break? It has 287,000 miles on it, two sets of tires, and two sets of brakes for almost 300,000 miles. And it's sitting in my driveway right now. It's sitting there. No, no I, I can go buy whatever car I want. That's not the point. The point is, is that sitting there talking. It's testifying. Okay, so do you understand that your paycheck, your paycheck should be talking louder than your need? Amen. That your bank account shouldn't have a bigger voice than God. 
Okay? All right. So here, here's, here's what happened to me. Just so you know, I didn't want to write these books. I didn't want to do any of this. So I went 23 years without talking about it. Can you imagine all the things that you've, you've heard and, and read? And I could stay quiet for 23 years. I did. But it says it was sacred to me. But now that I'm sharing it, I want you to get everything out of it. So this is what happened to me. Nothing that you give up goes unnoticed. Whatever you do for the Lord, your time here is going to be well worth it. I'm going to make sure of it myself. I'm going to yield to the Spirit like never before this morning because of the effort that you made to get here and to be here in this room. But here's what happened to me. Okay, imagine this. I... I wanted to know what it was like to skydive. So I went through training, and it, it was like this four-hour class to do two things. To look at your altimeter on your wrist, and when it said 5,500 feet, you went down here and you pulled this silver handle. It takes four hours to learn that. <laughs> Did you, everybody hear what I just said? Yeah. Well, you try it, because it all changes when you jump out of that airplane. Those two things are really hard. <laughs> so you're free falling for 33 seconds. And the only thing you have to do is keep looking. It's a, just a giant watch, but it's an altimeter. And you start out at 14,000 feet, and then when you get uh, to 5,500, you keep checking it, you know. And 5,500 feet, you just reach down, you pull that, that silver handle, and, and that's it. I mean... Even if you were stupid, you could still live after that, you know, but, but up until that point, it's amazing how stupid you get, right? Because why? Because see, now you're in an environment that you're not familiar with and your body says, you know what? You're on your own. Your mind says you're on your own and there's nothing left except you going to be with Jesus because your body just says, I'm, you know, it freezes and your mind freezes and your spirit's like, okay, I guess I'm going to Jesus. If you two don't do something. Right? Do you understand what I'm saying? So you do have parts to you. Right? Okay, so it's the same way with the spirit realm. Your spirit, your spirit understands things that your mind doesn't grasp, and your body just wants to go eat chicken all the time. <laughs> so you'll, you'll go to a restaurant, and you'll, you'll want to eat. And everything's fine. But you go, and you say, I'm going to pray for 10 minutes, and, and I'm not going to answer the phone. I don't care what happens. I'm going to pray for 10 minutes. And then all of a sudden, your body says, hey, there's chickens left over from last night. And then your mind goes, then your mind that, that didn't remember all the things that you should have done yesterday, all of a sudden, it remembers all those things. Oh, you got to do this. You got to do this. You got to do this. Next thing you do it, you can't believe it. You're clipping coupons to save 50 cents. And all you did was say you were going to pray in tongues. Okay? No, I'm serious. This is what, this is the truth, Right? So this is the way it was. When I jumped out of that airplane, I, I, I totally understood what four hours of instruction was for. It was for that, that, that environment that you enter into that, you're, that, that you have to dig deep within yourself. Well, see, that's what being a Christian is. Did you know that? Living in this world, in this realm, at this time, did you know that, that, that there are people in heaven that want to meet you? Because you were chosen to live at this time. They, they, didn't, they saw this day, but they didn't participate in this. I mean, there's people like Enoch. You know, you think you want to meet Enoch and Elijah and all those people? They want to meet you. Did you know that? Okay, I'll prove it to you. Jesus said, listen, John the Baptist, he just got baptized. He said, John, come here. And he said, John, look at John. He said, there's never been anyone in the kingdom as great as John. Okay, do you hear what he just said? He just told the people that he's better than Moses, Abraham, Enoch, Elijah, all those people, David, right? He said that there's nobody been greater in the kingdom than, 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 John, than uh, John the Baptist. Okay, he said, but from now on, the least in the kingdom is greater than him. Am I right? Yes. So all the people in heaven want to meet you. That's how valuable you are. I'm telling you this because you cannot fail if you pursue God, but the training will be intense because you have to be able to operate in a hostile environment, which I consider this realm a hostile environment. 
If you don't, you should just be with me when I travel. You mean, if there's demons anywhere in a person or around them, they start acting up. Now, I called Kathy one day when I was at work because I'd worked for a company for 30 years. And towards the end, the power of God was coming so strong that the, the demons were starting to manifest on the airplane. And then people were starting to, to get hit by the joy, and they're not even saved. And people would start crying when I'd walk by, down the aisleway of the airplane, at, you know, at five, seven miles up. They'd start, like, laughing or start crying. And they wouldn't understand it. Like, I asked them, I said, what's going on with you? He said, every time you walk by me, there's something on you. So this one day, I walked back to do my, my, my walkthrough to check with the other flight attendants, make sure everything was ready before we take off. And um, these, these, these uh, 15 people in the back, they all started yelling out at me, get out of here, leave us alone. I go, what? Excuse me, it's my airplane. He says, get back up to the front. I go, this is my airplane. We have a problem here? Because I'll just go right back to the gate right now. I'm sure there's some people out there who want your seats. It's a five-hour flight from Pittsburgh to uh, Las Vegas. So I get a call mid-flight, and, I, and um, Captain goes, there's something wrong back there. Can you go back? The girls aren't telling me everything. So I went back there, and um, I go, what's going on? And, and the flight attendant said, well, they won't let me tell you because we know that you, you'll you'll." You know, we'll go to lockdown. We're going to have to be escorted in. The guys are threatening to, to rape the women on the pl flight, but they're thinking they're just drunk. I said, that's not drunk. That's, that's a threat. That's a federal offense. So make a long story short, I called the pilots. I said, we got to go to lockdown and probably going to need a, you know, like an F-16 escort because these guys have threatened to, to rape the women on the plane. And so those guys will never fly again. Th th those people, it took eight cops to take them off. They fought the cops. What, what would make a person do all that? Okay, do you understand? But what I'm trying to tell you is, is I called my wife and I said, Kathy, I think it's time for me to retire. I said, it's just getting to the place where I think it's time to go in the ministry. Because, you know, the, these things are, the manifestation. See, what it is, is, is you, you get nose to nose with the kingdom of darkness. But see, God is his kingdom is advancing at such an alarming powerful rate that if you choose to participate in it it's going to be really a, quite a ride but you have to be ready to do what I I said that took 4 hours to ingrain in me in that environment because see what my goal is 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 not what you feel right now is Monday morning when I'm gone can you do this See, this isn't a drive-by. This is permanent discipleship. That's what Jesus said, no more drive-bys. He said, Kevin, no more drive-bys. The day of drive-bys is over. He said, you make disciples. You replicate me. That's what Jesus told me. How can I mess this up? He's right here. He said, replicate me. He said, I want everyone walking in this. Okay, so another, another, another circumstance. So just so you know, before we get into the teaching, I want you to understand what's going on here. I gave up the Air Force Academy to answer the call of God when I was 19. So I turned down the nomination for Senator Hines in Pennsylvania for the next year. And I left everything and I went to Bible school. And I had only been saved six months. What would make a person do that, to give up F-16s? Because he was more real to me than what I wanted to do. So does it surprise you that I finish college and then I go and I do another, another phase of my education and then I get an opportunity to travel with that ministry? And the Lord says, no, you're going to Southwest Airlines. I go, excuse me? <laughs> I'm going to be a singer for this ministry. I left everything for you. And then I thought, well, oh, he's going to have me be a pilot. He says, no, you're going to be a flight attendant. I go, what? <laughs> so I just want you to know this about me so that you know that this stuff doesn't come easy. It costs you. But you've got you to understand it's worth it all because this is what happened. 
Six months after I answered that call and I went to Southwest Airlines, a captain for Southwest Airlines, who is a Mormon, he comes to me and he says, you told Captain so-and-so that you wanted to get your commercial pilot's license. I go, yeah, eventually I will. I said, I, I left the, everything and I, you know, I'm, I'm, in, the, I'm in, the, in the ministry, so to speak, but I'm, I, I'm here at Southwest. He goes, well, are you going to be a pilot for Southwest? And I said, well, I want to get all my ratings and then I'm going to go, you know. And then he's like, what, what really are you going to do? I said, I'm called of God. He goes, well, yeah, I, I can understand that. He said, well, this is what happened to me. He said, when I was 16 years old, I used to go out and watch the airplanes take off and fly. And this guy came up to me. He goes, you want to learn how to fly? And he owned, like, part of the airport. And the guy goes, you know, my captain friend, he said, yeah. He said, well, why don't you come wash airplanes for me, and I'll give you all your ratings. All I ask is that someday you give it to someone else. So he gave him all his ratings. It was like, you know, my, mine, what he gave me was worth $250,000 worth of training. So he said, I have to do this before I die. So the Lord told me, you're the one. Now, he's Mormon. But he said, I have to give this because this guy did it for me years and years ago. So that's how I got my ratings. Okay, then I was training this girl on the airplane just to show you how this works. It always comes back to you. I was training this girl. She was an Air Force officer. Her husband is a a general now, a one-star general. But at the time, he was a, a colonel. He was ahead of the Luke Air Force Base uh, fighter squadron, the, the uh, F-16 part of it. So she said, why are you doing this, Kevin? I saw you up there in the cockpit, and you, you know the whole cockpit. I said, yeah, I can fly the airplane. I said, this isn't what the Lord had me do. I said, I left the Air Force Academy in nomination, and I told her all that. Well, she turns, and she goes in the galley like when we're on ground time, and I'm just training her as a flight attendant. And she gets on her phone. She's talking to her husband. And she flips, you know, we had flip phones back then, you know, just clip. And she goes, well, you just got your dream. I go, what? He goes, you're going to report to Luke Air Force Base, and my husband's going to give you ground training, and then you're going to fly in a simulator against him at our, our, our uh, Top Gun. You know, the, Na- the Navy has Top Gun, but they have what they call TAC Ace, Aces, which is the Top Gun of the Air Force, and it's at Luke. So he put me through the ground training, now, I just got my, my private commercial, you know, instrument rating, and then this guy did what he said. But then all of a sudden, as soon as I'm done with that, within a couple weeks, I'm flying with this girl and training her. And next thing you know, I am sitting, I am sitting in an F-16 cockpit, and I'm going through all the systems with this guy. Think, do you hear what I'm saying? For free. Yeah, and then he puts me in. They go in this, this classified section and a lot of it I can't even talk to you about. I'm not allowed to talk about what I was in there. But we flew against each other, and it was amazing. Now, here's the thing. I'm telling you this because are you ready to be accelerated? Because this is what happened. I, 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 was, I was traveling at the most in a, in, an F, in, a, in a Cessna 172 in a dive, <laughs> full throttle in a dive. I might get to a, a 125, 130, 140 miles an hour, maybe. Okay, so in this F-16, when we were, we were, you taxi out, you get ready to take off, and you, they said, well, you know, this has, this has military, which is 100%, and I'm thinking, that's it, you know? He goes, oh, no, then you pull the throttle out, and it's five clicks more in afterburn. There's five stages of afterburn. But, however, in the fifth stage of afterburner, you're burning 16,800 pounds of fuel a minute, which means you have three and a half minutes in afterburner at fifth stage and then you got to land or be refueled and i'm thinking i could fly for six hours in a cessna (laughs) you know and okay so it's oh by the way when you take off at 300 knots make sure your gears up i go what your gear gear up you, you pull the nose of the f-16 off and then you level off and you stay in what they call ground effect and you click on your, and I thought, there's not even any switches. You just do it on your throttle and on your stick. It's right there. So I, you have to get your, th- he said, if you don't get your, I went, what? I'm going to be at 300 knots on the runway at takeoff? 
He goes, oh, you're going to be at 450 at the end of the runway, but you got to get your gear up. As soon as your nose comes off, you have to level off, click your gear up, and then you're going to keep accelerating through 450 knots by the end of the runway. And then you can pitch up and go to 33,000 feet in a straight climb. And then I realized this is the way it was for me experiencing the other realm. Okay, so what it was, now think about this. While I'm doing the, the Cessna, I had no idea what was waiting for me, what, there, what more there was. But then when I encountered this airplane in, in the training phase of it, I realized there's so much more available, and there's guys that get paid to do this every day. Can you imagine? Now I know why those, those fighter pilots have grins on their faces. Because they can't even believe they're getting paid for this. But they're being trained, and this is what the training was really, really rigorous. And like when I went through, I had to go through aerobatics because I was training students. So when you train students, you have to learn how to recover aircraft because students want to kill you. And so they, they tell you that, 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 that the student's whole goal is to kill you. They tell you that so that you, in your mind, always watch the student. So they train us to take the airplane up three mistakes high. So a student can make three mistakes before you hit the ground. So you, you go up that high. But in, it's a mental thing. Okay, so here, here, here's what I'm trying to tell you now, is that the acceleration of where you're going in the body of Christ is where you're going to be operating in the supernatural all the time. It's not going to be just like a, a, a thing that happens every now and then randomly. Because the Lord, and I share this all with you because I got my dream. And it continues till today. It continues till today. Now I'm training, I'm training for corporate jets. Right now. With my own money, by the way. And I don't take a salary from the ministry. Just saying. Okay, so what is it like to be in the spirit? Well, see... You really are in the Spirit if you're being led by the Spirit. So here's what I want to ask you this. This puzzles me. I know it says, is it, honey, is it, um, is this Romans 8, 3 about the, uh, the, the he would let, it was at 8, 4, right? She's my concordance. <laughs> those who are led by the, the, the Spirit of God, right, are sons of God, right? Not those who are led by prophets of God, Right? Those who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God, right? Okay. Now, the Spirit of God moves through a prophet, but we don't seek prophets. We, we, we are sons of God, right? Because we're led by the Spirit, right? Now, some of you might not even know I was a pilot. I might not even look like a pilot. It doesn't matter. If you put me in a cockpit, you will not know me. That's my, and that is my environment. I gave that up. That, I, was, I was meant to be a pilot. If I, I, I do better upside down at Mach 2. I do. I get high off a of jet fuel. I just, the smell of it. You know what I mean? But you would never know that. But see, I was still that, even though you didn't discern it. Okay, that's the way it is with the body of Christ. No one discerns you unless they're spiritual. See, Paul said in the latter part of chapter 2 of 1 Corinthians that the spiritual person discerns or judges all things correctly. But he says he himself is not subject to any carnal man's judgment. You, a, a carnal person cannot judge you because they're not spiritual. That's what that was saying there. Okay, so I've, I've shared this with you just so you can understand that the spirit realm is fast. And the frustration that you're going through is that your born again spirit is alive to God. And you you know it shouldn't be taking this much time. And you know your body is being rebellious. And you know that your mind needs to get with it. And you're like 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 my spiritual father says, he he'll say something to me and then I just stand there and he goes, "You're burning daylight."
You see, because he lives out of his spirit. So he wants everyone to be at that speed. So your frustration is, is that you know what's right. You know what should be happening, and it's not. But see, that's what your training's for. So this day, today, is this kind of training. You might think some of this is basic. It's not. It's supernatural because what the only thing that I care about is that you do those two things. See, I want you to not, I don't want you to just live through what you're going through because we're not here to survive. We're here to take dominion and live as, as the sons and daughters of God. Amen. Father, I thank you for this time. I thank you for the impartation of the Spirit. I ask that everyone receive. Everyone receive. Angels of the Lord, you're on standby, and I thank you for it. Whew, man. Oh, my, my, my. Okay. All righty then. Okay, so the first thing I want to talk about as far as the heavenly realms, the Lord Jesus Christ, he, he gave me an impartation when I was with him by just being around him. He didn't breathe on me. I didn't give him an offering. He didn't touch me. He didn't lay his hands on me. I stood in his presence for 45 minutes, and it, it did something to my spirit. And then he sent me back, and... It was hard to live here because my body and my mind weren't up to speed. So he told me, he said, you need to disciple people. You need to train people how to live in the supernatural and live in the physical. So you can prosper in your spirit and not prosper in your body or in your mind. Paul prayed that you would prosper in all of them. Okay, so you can't like say, okay, God's going to do this for me, but he, I don't believe in this. Don't, don't go there with God. I did. And he's still wrecking me. He's still wrecking me because I said, well, I don't believe in that stuff. You want to hear about it? I didn't believe in all that gold and that silver stuff. You know, the dust and all that. I mean, you know, I thought, you know, this is fake. You know, Jesus didn't sprinkle glitter on me and send me back. You know what I mean? So I started like, no, Whatever. You know, I just care about what, how people walk right. You know, I just want people to walk right. It's like if you fall on the ground and get hit by God, I just want to see how you act when you get up. And you go to your car and somebody has scratched your car. A church member. That's what counts. So, like, I, I, because I was there, I, I'd get hit by God. I'd get thrown 20 feet. And I, I, I had the same devil waiting for me at, the, at my car before I even got out of the parking lot that I've been dealing with. So this is not an amusement ride because <laughs> then you just want more. And then you go from meeting to meeting and get hit by God, but does it change you? Right? Okay. Okay, so this is what happened to me. I was on my way to Phoenix to speak, and, and uh, I was in my office in New Orleans, and we were the person who was going to pick us up to the airport was already there. But the Lord said, I want you to go to the original Hebrew. I'm like, what? excuse me, Lord, we're going to the airport right now. Go to the original Hebrew and print out they left Egypt with the gold and the silver. In the Hebrew, print it out on two sheets of paper. I go, two sheets? He said, two sheets. So I, I'm, out, I'm up there printing out. I'm, I'm going through the, in, in highlighting the Hebrew for, for that verse and printing it out on two sheets of paper. I folded it up into four pieces and I, I put it in my, my, my pouch. I was going to be preaching on the five stones of David at, at, this, at this meeting in Phoenix. So I put that in the pouch with it. So I get there and multiple meetings and everything. But then when we got there, uh, she, she called me up to speak. This lady, no, no, just so you know, this lady was the assistant to Sister Ruth Heflin for 22 years. And every time I would show up for her meeting, she would give the whole thing over to me. 
so I get up and I speak, and the power of God hits, and five hours later, people are laid out, and, and, and I'm just sitting in my chair, and I'm like, it's, you know, she doesn't care, but it's like it's supposed to last two hours. It lasts five every time. And I'm just sitting there. I'm drunk. And she goes, Kevin. She comes up to me and my wife, Kevin, do you have two sheets of paper? I go, what? She says, do you have two sheets of paper? I need to give you. The Lord told me. I've been holding this since 1972. I have something for you. So she pulls out two vials. One is full of gold and one's full of silver. She picked it up in the carpets from those meetings in Ruth Heflin. And she's been holding it, and she said, you're the one that's supposed to have this. So, so I, I open these sheets of paper, and it says, they left Egypt with the silver and the gold. It says it right there in Hebrew. She pours it, gold there and silver on that one. And I fold them up, and I put them in my pouch. I have them with me. I, I take them everywhere I go now. Because, see, this is something I don't even believe in. <laughs> so don't, don't tell God you don't believe in stuff. I mean, if it's in his word. I mean, you know, I believe his word and, you, you know, if you're going to say something, if it's freaky, like kissing camels and you'll get healed, you know, I'm, I'm, you know, that's freaky. <laughs> Did you get it? Okay. Okay, so this is what happened. So we go home. We go home because we have a home in Phoenix. So we're speaking there. We go into that home in Phoenix. And I look at Kathy and I go, what just happened? And all of a sudden, the power of God hit us. We just started laughing, and we fell. And the, the whole house filled up with angels. I mean, it felt like, like all, if all of you just came and surrounded me and my wife, bunched in around us, that's what it felt like. And I don't even believe in this stuff. You, get, you see what I'm saying? We, we fell, and we just laid there. And we didn't kick our little button saying we fall and we can't get up. No, we didn't do any of that. We just, we just laid there under the power of God. And I said, Lord, what just happened? He said, he, first of all, he corrected me. Don't ever, don't ever say you don't believe in something just because you haven't experienced it. He said, but this is what he said. He said, those angels know that you have in your possession something that's from another realm. Okay. So I made the mistake again. I was in Mississippi, and I'm standing up here, and it's Saturday night, and there's a couple sitting right back there where you all are sitting back here, about three rows from the back. And um, the Lord says, call them out. They just lost their ministry. Uh, they've had a lot of trouble. They, they, they don't even have a building now. You pull them out and tell them, I'm going to reverse everything. They're going to get everything back and more, and they're going to be put right into the ministry that God has for them. And I said, you know what? What if they work at Piggly Wiggly or something? You know, and they're in the vegetable apartment, you know? Because I don't want to be a false prophet. See, when I prophesy, I'm serious. I met Jesus, okay? He's the word of God. Now, in the Old Testament, if you missed it, they had, everybody had a rock to throw at you, to kill you. Right? So when I prophesy to someone, I, I picture rocks. I say, Do I, am I hearing from God? Because I'm going to feel it in a minute if I didn't hear. Okay, so this is what happened. Um, I, said, I'll, I said, Lord, I want to pray this out. So he was gracious to me. So Sunday morning, they're in the same place again. So I called them out, and I gave them their word. And they, and they started shaking and crying. And then I never saw them again. So that was in February. So in, in December, my, I get a, my manager calls. He says, hey, Kevin, I know that, I know that you know, we have all these invites, and we're not going to get to all of them. But he said, would you pray over these? And he always has me, we always pray over everything. But we say no to 8 out of 10 because we can't be everywhere. And I did 300 meetings last year. I can't do that every year. It was, I, I, it's easier for me to go back and fly. It, it's better to work, go to work for 12 hours. Then, then ministry is not easy. So it's like because you, you got to be in there. It's like riding a wave all the time. Okay, so I prayed over this one. They said this is the invite. It was in, in Dalton, Georgia. It says we, we can't afford you. We only have 55 people. But if the Lord speaks to you to come, please come. So I had to pay my airfare, my hotel, for me and my wife. And, um, and the Lord said, do it. So I did. So we flew an hour and a half. We drove two hours to this building. And guess who's meeting me at the door? That couple. This is what they said. Do you like your word?
See, this is the realm that God wants you to walk in. You just made flesh something that was spirit. When you spoke, you took from that realm. You yanked it out of there. See, do you want to be trained like that? Okay, this is what happened. He said, oh, that's nothing. He said, I want you to come here. Stand right here. I go, I got hit by God. I go, whoa, what happened here? He goes, this is where Jesus appeared to me and gave me my instructions after he gave us this building. And he told me to give you this. And he, he hands me a 10 carat, eight cut amethyst stone that Jesus left for him to give to me. And I don't even believe in this. <laughs> read him out of a psalm. Jesus read him a psalm and then walked out. And then he found this stone left for him to give to me. Okay, now listen to this. Now, this guy in that he's friends with, that is with him in this ministry, his Bible starts leaking oil in that psalm. And to date now, it's been over 90 gallons have come out of that Bible. And I don't even believe in this stuff. How do you explain that? But I'm not pursuing these signs. But what I'm trying to tell you is you've got to be careful. Why are you limiting something? Because you have an experience. Oh, I would never skydive. Why? Why? Because I just wouldn't. Why would I want to leave a perfectly good airplane? I beat the airplane down. It was the weirdest thing. I'm going somewhere with all this. I'm walking you into this. I'm trying to show you something. I can go on and on where the Lord has destroyed my idols. Things that I have limited God with are idols. They're idols. Okay, so... If you want to get heaven's attention, what is it that you need to do? You need, you need to make yourself available, which means that you are a good soldier. Now, a soldier, according to Paul, does not involve himself in civilian affairs. So a good soldier of Christ is a parallel of the military. That's why most people that are religious will not accept the true, absolute truth of heaven, because God is living and sitting on a throne that has layers, foundations. If you check it out in Psalms 89, it, it tells you there's a layer of, of, of righteousness and a layer of justice, and the truth surrounds him. That's the angels, the truth of faithfulness. I mean, faithfulness surrounds him. There's truth in his, in his throne. So when he judges, he judges righteously. Like I said last night, he doesn't ask you for your opinion about anything. In fact, he wrote a book about you, according to Psalms 139, verse 16. He wrote a book about you without you being in the meeting. Never once invited you to one of the board meetings. Think about it. Think about the way you think. You're like, why do those 24 elders get to go to those meetings and I don't? Well, the Trinity's having meetings about you right now. And the angels are being instructed according to what you can believe for. But see, belief is really trust. And you can't trust somebody unless you know them. So here's the key, the key to walking in the supernatural in order to get heaven's attention, you have to look at people that got heaven's attention. So Jesus instructed me. Now, how can I mess this up? He's just right there. He told me the church right now, right now the church is at the pool of Bethesda. They're waiting for the water to be stirred, waiting for a random act like an angel go down and play with the water, and the first person in gets touched, gets healed. And Jesus said the whole time, the head of the universe who created that man is standing before him. But he doesn't what? He doesn't discern who he is. So he's telling Jesus his sad story. In case it gets stirred, maybe Jesus would help him in, right? That's what the church is at right now. See, we're waiting for the water to be stirred. Jesus said that's where we're at right now. He said, if, if you discern who I am. Now he said, this is what he said. He said, Kevin, he said, why did people 
that yelled out, son of David, get healed. I go, oh. They discern. He said, saying the son of David was saying Messiah. It was the lineage of David. Okay, so when people said, have mercy on me, have compassion on me, thou son of David. They were saying, you are the Messiah. You are the deliverer, the one we've been waiting for. I put my faith in you. Have mercy on me. They always got healed. Jesus like, stop. But when he went to his own hometown, what did they call him? The son of a carpenter, right? So he said all they got was a table and chairs. <laughs> That's what he said. So he said, you tell the people in every meeting that I don't want to see anybody going with a set of table and chairs to their car today. <laughs> see, because that's what, it shows what you discerned. Okay, so knowing him is better than seeing his acts, right? So Israel saw his acts, but Moses knew his ways. Okay, if you study that out, in order to get heaven's attention, you got to know God's personality. you got to know his ways, the way he likes to do things. Now, what did I just tell you? He's not asking for your opinion. See, the thing, the threat to our society, like I said last night, is, is there's an attack on absolute truth. And his, his, his foundation, his throne is built on that, okay? So it's not up for, you can't tell God, you know, can you move that, that altar of incense over a little bit. It's, it's kind of, I don't like it there. It's, it's, I can't see the, the cherubim. No. God sets in the church. God set into motion. So when he breathed you out into your mother's womb, I mean, I stood on the spot where he breathed me out in my mother's womb, and I was standing there now giving an account for my life. It was a circle. And his word returned to him. That's what happened to me. So Jesus thought of me. He showed me the whole process. He let me walk into his eyes, and I watched the process of him in, in, in creating me. I saw in his mind, he formed me in, in his mind. He named me, and then he breathed me out, and my spirit went into my mother's womb. And I wasn't a mistake. And he said, your parents were privileged to carry you. Because I was a voice to this whole generation. And and devil tried to kill me so many times. And and you wouldn't believe the stuff that was said to me and how I was rejected. But see, what it was, it was a war against who I was as a person it, it, and who owned me. That's what the war is with you. See, God thought of you, He breathed you out into your mother's womb. And he wrote a book about you. According to Psalms 139, 16, you have to believe it if you're a Christian. So God's intent was in his word and in his breath. So when you were formed, you weren't an accident. How you got your body might be an accident. But that's just your earth suit. Who you are is what God intended when he breathed you out. And there's a whole book written about you. Now, this is the absolute truth. This is not being made up. This is not a bedtime story. I'm not trying to make you feel better. I'm telling you the truth about who you are. Jesus sent me back because he wanted me to tell you what I just told you. I have to tell everybody in the world this. I don't care how it's going to be done. I don't care how I do it. That's why you'll see me everywhere. You'll see me everywhere because it's, a, it's all set up. It's, a, it's rigged in my favor. He told me, he said, if you come back, you cannot lose. He said, I'm going to make sure you have everything you need. You don't have a thing to worry about. And it has never, never failed. Everything that he said to me has happened. It's the same with you. What he spoke about you, what he wrote about you, what he thought about you, was embodied. So the real you is who you are inside, and that's the person who is frustrated. Because you don't understand time. You don't know why you have to wait. 
I spoke the word. It should have happened. That's absolutely correct. But we're in a fallen world, and you have to beat the devil over the head at least twice a day because he, he's hard of hearing. He is. He really is. So I'm serious. He said, Kevin, remember when you used to train for marathons? I used to run 10, 10 miles a day was nothing. Me and my wife used to run eight miles a day. And then I wore out all the cartilage in my knee. Now I'm believing for cartilage for my knee. It's one of the few things left that I need besides my hair. I mean, that my hair is coming too. But, but I, he's healed me of, of harder things than that already. And I shouldn't even be alive. So that's even harder. How do you raise yourself from the dead? Okay. But I remember we would run. I would run. Me and her would run eight miles in Phoenix at 112. And it wouldn't even, we wouldn't even sweat. That's after me flying for six days in a row. But I remember when I was training in Pennsylvania, when I lived there growing up, I remember this dog used to wait for me every day. You know, and I guess he was thinking that he had to earn his keep from his master, so he made it look like he was working, like he'd just ferociously come out and, you know, I'm going to kill you in a corner of the yard there, and I was on the, on the road. Well, he just got more braver because I let him, and he got closer and closer, and then one day he took a hunk out of my, my calf. And I learned something from that. So what I do is from then on, every time a dog encounter, encounter a dog, I wouldn't back off in fear. I would come at him. And the dog looked at me bug-eyed because he didn't have a plan B. <laughs> See, he's thinking, he's, he's developed a response in people, okay? So he figures, you know, he just do this. No, like you, if any one of you would, would pull a gun and come up to me, I would have it and have it pointed at your head, and you wouldn't even know what happened because I'm not afraid to die. But see, a person that pulls a gun on me doesn't plan on that happening. And they're nervous, and I'm not because I've already died. I have the hat, the T-shirt, everything. I don't like, it doesn't matter to me. Do you understand? They can't kill me. But I couldn't talk like this before this happened. Okay, so I came at that dog, and that dog didn't understand what just happened and was afraid of me now. So the Lord told me, now you do that to the devil. I go, oh, I'm going to get hit. I'm going to get repercussions. You know, and everybody like, you know, and they were like, Don't you, uh, what, what are you doing? What are you saying? You know, you're going to die in a plane crash because you're bragging about, about you know, got, you know, nobody can touch you. I said, well, I've been 29 years, five flights a day. That plane is not going down without me. Because when I was in heaven, I saw that God isn't bound by time. So the thing that changes this nation is prayer. The changes everything in your life is prayer. You can actually reverse and change the past that hasn't even happened yet to try to figure that one out. But see, you can reverse the past. I've reversed the past. I've actually saw stuff and fixed it. So you can change things that are going to occur. That's why you have these bad dreams, because that's what the devil's going to do if you don't do anything about it. See, your spirit is receiving information, but your mind is like a third grade level. So you dream, but you got this really downgraded system that needs an upgrade, needs the new software. It's your mind. So at night, your mind is trying to interpret what your spirit is seeing. So you have dreams. But I'm telling you this. My dreams have turned into reality months before it happens now. I have dreams about what is exactly going to happen. Be why? Because my mind's renewed by the word of God, Romans 12, 2. I'm transformed now. See, my mind sides with my spirit. This is part of the training. And when your body wants chicken, you go, you know what? Now you're going you're gonna to miss two meals. And if you keep sassing, it'll be at least three days before we eat. See, you tell, you tell your body, I'm in control here. You're not calling the shots. Well, see, you do the same thing. See, when you get all three parts of you, your mind, will, and emotions is your soul. Suke, 
or it, in, the, in the Greek, it's the same word for psychology. It's your mind, will, and emotions, okay? Spirit, the spirit part of you is pneuma in the Greek. So when Paul said in 1 Thessalonians 5, 23, when he named the three parts of man, when your spirit, soul, and your body, they're three different words. It means three different things. So you're three parts, that, and, and those parts, only one of them is redeemed. Your spirit's born again. So that's why it's so important that you respond right in any situation. You, ha you have to be sober-minded like it, Paul told Titus in Titus 2.6. So my bottom line is, you notice I don't look at my notes, but I'm quoting all these scriptures. You see, because I, I learned that once I leave that airplane, I don't have time to look at my manual. And you don't want me looking at my manual on, on pre-flight, and you're sitting there, you're, and I'm taking you somewhere, and I'm looking, and, and you, I, you see me turn to the first, hey, what's this red button do? Right? Do you understand what I'm saying? See, do you understand now about God? Once you know God, you trust him because you know him. Okay, you know the airplane, and then the pilot knows the airplane, and then you can put trust in the pilot because he knows the airplane equipment, but you don't. So you have to trust him. That's what you do every day when you go to the airport. And you see it all the time. I mean, I, I, I was like a pastor on an airplane for 29 years. I saw people at their worst because they're not in control. And so I had to pastor them. This is what I would, that's what I did for 29 years, is I was there to help people. But they were out of control in the sense of they didn't have control. So can you relinquish all your control to God? Because that's what a Christian does. A Christian trusts God, but it doesn't trust God because you saw God act. See, that's what Israel did. They, they saw God's acts. Moses knew his ways, but guess what? Moses went up to the mountain. Moses' face glowed. Moses saw the glory of God, not his presence. Is that what you want? Okay, here's how you do it. This is what happens. You live in two realms. You live in a spiritual realm and you live in a physical realm. And your soul attaches the two. But your soul was given to you to enjoy the journey. But see, in a fallen world, it's all messed up. See, you were built to be fast, quick, highly responsive, efficient, excellent. You want, you like good stuff. You like the feel. You like beautiful things. And you buy the cheap because that's what you can afford. But you love the good stuff, right? I loved it when that gear came up and I looked at my airspeed, it was 300 knots. I loved that. I loved it by the end of the runway when I started to pitch up, I was at 450 knots, which is almost 500 miles an hour or a little over. And that's just the end of the runway. I haven't even done anything yet. Okay, so that was always available to me, but I knew Cessna. My world was Cessna. Well, see, that's what happens to a lot of believers. They, they, hear, they hear these kind of things. And you know, how many people get sent back and get to talk about it? But I'm telling you, you can do this. It is so rigged in your favor. It is so rigged in your favor. But you're being told all these things that are not even true. You, you, you know, I heard a man. You know what? You, some people have changed my life. I heard this man on a tape. Never met him. Still haven't met him until today. But this is what he said. He said, I believe in, the, I believe in God so much. I, I believe God so much that you can throw me out of an airplane with my Bible, and in three years I'll have a city there. It changed my life forever. I thought, who is this guy that would even say that? Well, what if it's not God's will? See, that's what I'm thinking. Religious thing. Well, what if it's not God's will? Jesus showed me that all the limitations that I have are based on this realm, not on his realm. Okay, so you, you're operating in Cessna faith, and that's what you get. You get 140 miles an hour. And, you know, it takes you five hours to get everywhere. It takes me 20 minutes. 
I don't, I don't like to drive at all. Why? Because I've been fine for 30 years. I love the fact, I love the fact that Southwest Airlines took care of me. I'd get up in the morning, I'd go down the lobby, get my crew together, and there'd be a van waiting for us, and they would take us to the airport. And then the pilots and all of us, we would be taken through security, around security, to our airplane. And then everything was there for me to do my job, everything. And as long as I just followed the manual, no one cared. I was in charge, and, and nobody, I, had, I had really no accountability at all because I was in charge. All I did was answer the captain if he asked questions. But everybody did their job. And you know, if, if somebody under me didn't do their job, I would just do it for them. And then when we were done, we'd get to the, to the city where we we're going to be for the night, and the door would open, and there'd be another crew to replace us. And they'd be waiting. And they'd come on, help us clean. We'd go to the hotel, hotel van waiting for us, take us to the hotel. And then they had their keys for us already. Go up to the hotel, and they'd give us money to spend on the overnight. And I was making more on the money they gave me to spend on the overnight than I did at my other job. And that's not even including my wages. Did you hear what I just said? That's the way it is with God. He takes care of his own. He's a, he's a father. Okay, but, but what you're dealing with is the devil's work in this realm. If you don't believe me, try to answer this question. Why did Paul in Galatians, he, he listed the works of the flesh, right? Okay, did you notice that one of them was witchcraft? Okay, I thought that witchcraft was spiritual. <laughs> See, you don't know everything. Jesus took me and he said, look, he took me to this verse in this very obscure verse. Everybody knows part of it, but it's in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, I believe, where it says that he, he says that he, he said that we, our weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they're mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. Everybody stops there. Jesus went further. Of course he did. <laughs> he said, he said, bringing in captivity of every thought to the obedience of Christ. Every thought. Okay, I thought I was going to have to wrestle demons all day. So my friends, they want, me to rent, they want me to rent a hot air balloon with them because they want to go up and do spiritual warfare in the heavenlies. I go, I do it for my apartment for free. <laughs> you all didn't get that. I go, I don't have to go looking for devils. They come looking for me. And I'm like, you want a piece of me? And they just line up. And I just beat the living daylights out of them so that they go back and report so it gets around, and, and they just say, you know what? Don't go near him. You want to? Because he's a real Christian, because he knows God's ways. I think we need to take a break, because I'm feeling the glory right now. <laughs> the Jesus I met has a command about him. And what he said, he said, Kevin, I bought everything for everyone. I am not going back and doing that again. I'm not going through that again. So I made sure I purchased everything, which means your well-being. Now, why would somebody who serves the devil get a raise and I don't? And I'm serving God and tithing. Okay, that's just one argument I have. Why is it that it's so hard for a Christian to prosper? And then after you work so hard, then you go to church and, and some churches tell you, you know, that you can't believe for God to prosper you. It's like, well, so what do you want to do? You know, you know, just so you know, if an angel shows up in my room and says, I've been sent by the Lord to lay hands on you so that you'll be poor. The Lord has sent this as his will for you. I go, you know, back off, Jack. You know, don't touch me. <laughs> why, why, why? It's not in me to believe that. It's just like it's not in, my, in, in me to believe that an angel would come and say, the Lord has, has destined you to have cancer. He's going to teach you some things. I'm like, but back off, Jack. You don't touch me. Why? Why? Because it's not in me. Because I already met the person who it was testified that he went around doing good and healing everyone that was oppressed by the devil. 
even mentions the origin of it. So why would, why would I want to get out of God's will? And if it is God, why, why do you go to the hospital then? Okay, if you don't believe in prosperity, why do you go to work? Why do you sell yourself eight hours and they don't even pay you what you're worth? But you don't believe in, in all that stuff. Well, then, okay. But see, the thing is, I tell people all the time, I have to believe in prosperity so I can pay for all my friends' meals because they don't believe in prosperity. So I have to believe for... I'm serious. Listen to me. Listen to me. I, I, just, I just... I went to a meeting. I'm not going to say it too much. But I went to a meeting... And they were arguing. These are businessmen. They were arguing with me because the treasurer didn't want to pay for my breakfast, me and my wife's breakfast, while I was speaking. <laughs> and he goes, I can't believe it. I says, don't worry about it. I said, I said, I'm paying for the hotels. I'm paying for the airfare. I said, and, I'm, and right now, I feel the power of God. I said, I'm paying for every, all, the, all 29 of you's breakfast. So I, I said, I just wanted you to know, I'm paying for all your breakfast. And then I spoke for an hour and a half. And this is what I told him. I let him have it. I said, you know, if you had Bill Gates come in here in his, his Gulfstream 650, you'd have no problem with that. He could tell you how to get rich. That's fine. But I come in the name of the Lord. And I flew southwest because no one will let me have a plane because they don't believe that I should have one, even though I can fly one. But so I fly southwest. And I come here, and I tell you about eternal life. And I can't talk about prosperity. And Jesus told me, he said, my people won't let me into their finances. And Jesus says, and it's obvious. Do you understand? So I have, I'm glad I feel better now. But do you, do you, do you understand, like, well, why should I be speaking to, to, to businessmen about prospering and get the brakes put on me and then pay for their breakfast. And I'm the speaker. Right? Do you get it? Okay, okay. Now, I worked 30 years really hard. I worked so hard that, that I asked the Lord, I want to get out of debt. So I said, this is what I said, Lord, I believe I'm going to get out of debt. And you know what I did next? Because I'm from old school. I was brought up. I was brought up to work hard. Okay? So I prayed in tongues and the Lord said to me, I want you out of debt. It's not right. So I worked up, looked up and did a word study on telestai, the word telestai. Jesus said, you know, it's translated, it is finished, but it really says debt paid in full. Paid in full is what it says. So Jesus announced when he died, he said telestai, paid in full. And that's what they would stamp on you when you paid your tax to the Roman government. So the Lord told me it's not, it's not, it's not my will for you to be in debt. It was a brand new concept to me. I just thought that's what you did. So you know what happened to me? This is what happened. The Spirit of the Lord, I, I said, okay. So I didn't just like, okay, I'm going to miss meals. I'm going to fast and pray. I'm going to get out of debt. No. You know what I did? <laughs> the Lord visited me, came behind me, not that long after that. And he said, Kevin, you cannot fly next Tuesday night, uh, September 11th. You cannot fly because the worst incident in aviation history is about to happen. So give your trip away to someone else. But you're not flying on Tuesday, September 11th. This was on Friday. Now, I'm, I'm loading up my SUV. You know, the one that has 300,000 miles on it. And we're going to the mountains to pray. And we prayed that whole weekend in intercession to where we couldn't breathe with fellow flight attendants. And I believe we stopped that last plane. But here's what happened. I got rid of that trip, and I watched it from home. I was supposed to be in Islip that night, go through, go through Baltimore, from Phoenix to Baltimore. First flight out of Phoenix in the morning at 6 p.m. or 6 a.m. into Baltimore and then to Islip for the night. Didn't do any of it. And then all my friends quit because, you know, this is just going to keep happening. And so I didn't quit my job. And so they, 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 were, they didn't have people to fly airplanes. So they were saying, if you come to work, we'll give you double time, triple time, whatever you want. 
because we have to, we have to get these planes. So, you know, I could have said, well, you know, I'm fasting and praying because I'm going to get out of debt. See, you don't get it. Do you, you all get it? Okay. I'm trying to tell you what happened. Okay. Are you ready for this? I don't mind telling you this because don't be jealous of me because if it drives you into doing what you're supposed to do, this is what happened. I, the, I got a word from the Lord. I had a visitation in my backyard. He told me to get out of debt. And then my ship came in, but I had to work. Are you ready for this? No, please, pro I'll promise you won't be mad at me and jealous. In the next nine years, I made $950,000 at Southwest Airlines. As a flight attendant, <laughs> apologizing for weather and giving people Cokes and Sprites. If you, if you flew with me on those planes during those years, if, now you know why I was smiling all the time. I was making 180 bucks an hour sometimes. We got out of debt. But we still had our house. So the Lord said, well, okay, start sewing in there. So we started paying um, my, my pa couple pastors. They had houses. We paid their mortgage payment we, for, the, for the month and things like that. And next thing you know, somebody in Kathy's family left us money to pay off our house. And so we got, we got our house paid off in February 2009 during the housing debacle when everybody was, was, uh, couldn't make their payments on a house. It took two hours for me to get into Chase to get my AB, my routing number and my payoff amount for the, before the 15th. Because you pay 15th or after the 15th, you need the routing number and the exact amount, and then you wire it to them. So I, I just needed that from the, from the people that were handling this. They said, oh yeah, your house is paid off. Whoa, now we have no bills. Okay, so I waited two hours to get through because people were calling and saying, I can't make my payment, I'm going to default. Okay, so I finally get through this, and I said, yes, I'd like to pay off my house. And they go, this is not funny, Mr. Zadai. I go, I, I think it's hilarious. <laughs> they go, this is a joke, right? I go, no, this is not a joke. I want to pay off my house right now. And the guy starts, like, he's, he goes, I am so sorry. He goes, all we do all day is listen to these heartbreaking stories. People are losing their houses, and you call in. I think it's a prank call. I go, no. I said, I said, God did a miracle. I start witnessing to the guy. Okay, so I get the routing number and, I, and the payoff. Okay, so th they process it. And then I get a, a statement. I'm supposed to get a statement that I have, um, I'm pay, it's, it's zero, zero, you know. I get a statement threatening me that if I do not pay zero dollars and zero cents by the 15th, <laughs> that I will be reported to all three uh, credit agencies. I have the letter. I should have brought it. I was actually was disobedient. I was supposed to bring it. But it, it really says, so I called him. I waited two hours again. I go, what is going on? He goes, I don't know, Mr. Zay. How much do you owe? I go, zero, zero. He goes, what? <laughs> he goes, read it to me. I go, it's got your letterhead on. It says this. If you do not pay zero dollars and zero cents by the 15th, you'll be in default. It'd be reported to all three and Experian, and I named all the three agencies. He goes, no way. He goes, here, let me do it. He says, what's the, you know, the reference number? So I put it. So he went in and put in the computer. The computer spit it back out. He said, wouldn't take it. So I'm on hold while he talks to his supervisor. Now, this is, this is what the system that you're fighting against. You, you think you figured this out. It's much deeper than that. After 15 minutes, he came back. He goes, the only thing that the computer will let you do is if you send a check for zero dollars and zero cents. <laughs> and they run it through. They run it through and scan it to where it, it registers it with a payment. You get it? You see, the, that, that satanic system, it's so entrenched that even the bank system wouldn't accept what God had done. Okay? That's why I'm teaching you this stuff. Okay, so there's, 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 things, there's things in our midst that the Holy Spirit wants to do. And, and part of this is the training, but it's the deep training. It's like I was talking about the spin training. When you go, when you, we had to put our airplane into a spin and then get it out. So there's, there's, there's three easy steps to get your plane out of a spin. And so you, you do that. Four, if you, it, it, four in some circumstances, there's four. But you sit for hours. And then I had 10 hours of instruction for three easy steps. But you know what? Once that FAA officially took me up, and because I had to go with an FAA guy to do this. So we were in a parachute. 
he says, I'm going to put one in, I'm going to pull it out, and then I, uh, you, you can do it next. So he puts it up over and flips us over. We go into a stall and a spin. And then um, I'm looking. He does everything perfectly. Pull out as the ground's coming at us, you know. He goes, okay, it's your turn. So we climb back up. And, you know, it's weird to have to stall an airplane because it's just something you don't ever want to happen. And then you're, here you are, you're doing it. So the airplane just flips violently and starts a spin. And, you know, it was so hard to do those three steps. And see, as a Christian, we're supposed to operate naturally in the supernatural. So we're supposed to automatically, your response should be what the Spirit is telling you to do. So what the Spirit was telling me to do about this, this whole dispensation we're in right now is you can stop everything from happening. You can stop the war with Israel. That was five years ago. I've been faithfully telling everybody. You can stop it. It's not happening. Not only that, everything's shifting to now where it could be indefinitely to where we continue to grow and prosper as a nation and as a, as a body of believers in this country. Why? Because we chose to be who we are and where we've been placed. We grow where we're at. Okay, but the Spirit, the spirit wants, wants me to emphasize these things. Jesus said what? I am the, the way, the truth, and the life. Right? I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Right? He said that, right? John 14? Right? They haven't taken that out yet, have they? Okay. Now listen to me. Now listen to me. Don't get mad at me. But I heard the Pope say a couple years ago, there are many ways to God. Did I not? So I closed my eyes and I listened to that. I don't know it's the Pope. I'm just listening, okay? Say, no, I hear Jesus say, I am the way, the truth, and life. And that registers with my spirit as absolute truth. But yet, when I hear what I heard, I said, wait a minute. What about what Jesus said? And all of a sudden, it didn't register. In my soul, I started to reason it out. Okay, well, that, you know. And it's like, then I started to realize, this is how deception starts. This is how it starts. You start to depart. And so in, in training, like um, we, we would do our flight plans, but if we didn't correct for wind, and, and if you just didn't use the autopilot, the autopilot is, is actually the best way to go on long flights. But if you didn't, if you try to fly it, if you were off one degree in a two-hour flight, you were in another state when you got to your destination with one degree because it kept getting bigger and bigger and bigger. It kept getting bigger and bigger. And before you know it, it's the same thing with your descent. You're at 35,000 feet. And you have to start down 110 miles out because you're going 550 miles an hour. You're, you're talking states, not just you're going to miss your city. You're going to miss your state. If you don't start down because you're, you're, you're starting down and you're managing your descent and your speed. Not only that, it's not just about you. You know, there's other people in the air. And you want to become with one with another airplane, <laughs> you know, and there are highways up there, you know. And so you have to manage it. So it is when, when God has you on a profile, when he has, he has said certain things, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except me. Then you should accept that as absolute truth. And then what happens is you're on the track. See, so this is what you do with every single scripture that you read. You, you implement it into your life because, like I was saying, what comes out of you in an emergency is what you really have. You don't go to your manual. Moses, Moses had to cover his face. Why? Because people chose not to go to the mountain with him at the beginning. You didn't get that. They didn't go with him. So he went by himself. He comes down and now they're complaining. Why? Because his face glowed. It, he said they were, it says that he was fearsome to look at. Because there was beams. It says beams of light coming from his face if you study it out. Well, he, was, he, was, he had this, the, the power of God. The, the presence of God, the glory, was, it permeated. And Jesus, I said, Jesus, what happened there? He said, spending time up there with me, he started to be transformed back 
to the pure stock of Adam and Eve. His spirit came forward out of his face, his physical face, and he was transformed. Is it time to quit now? Is this, is it, when, 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 no, no, like what, is, would this be a good time? Right now? Because it's getting about that time. So, I don't, I don't understand everything, but I understand a lot more than I did. But this is what I wanted to tell you, is that in your normal life, it's really not normal. Because in the spirit, you're stirring up stuff everywhere you go. It, it, it really is, it's, and it's working. Your prayers are working. Everything about you is speaking. I saw this. And I told Jesus, I said, if I would have known what I know now and what I saw when I was there, I would have done so much more for you. And so he sent me back. And so he wanted me to teach people what I learned about the spirit realm and how to live in both realms. 